So it's 7 o'clock on a Sunday morning in North. A uh, lady comes in and her chief complaint is, I feel like an old lady. <laughs> so the thing is, though, she's a 30-year-old female uh, coming in with just feeling weak, bilateral knee pain, pleuritic mid and lower back pain, and diffuse myalgias. She comes in after working the weekend as a pole dancer. She was doing 12-hour shifts in a warm environment and not staying well hydrated. So that's her story, but when she comes in the room, what do I see? She's covered in bruises. And this is one of those distracting details that you just can't ignore. And I and the nurse asked her in multiple different ways, are you safe at home? Are you safe at work? Is there anything? And this is one of those things you need to be persistent and ask. And she said no. So back to the story, she was working 12-hour shifts. It's not an it's activity she did in the past but hasn't done recently. So she says she wasn't in shape for it. Involved falling from four feet to the ground, landing on her knees and buttocks. And just sore pain, 9 out of 10, ibuprofen, not cutting it. Also on some medication, she was on an SSRI, also on an antipsychotic, had a histi history of IV drug abuse, but stated that she'd been clean for six months. And of note, she does have an anaphylaxis allergy to Cody. Her vitals were unremarkable, notably no tachycardia. She was afebrile. She was uncomfortable appearing on exam, but she appeared hydrated, did have pain over the T and L spine, and had ecchymosis out over her knees and the skin bruising, which is notably in the antecubital fossa and also in the knees. So differential, pleuritic back pain, was it a pneumothorax? Is it dehydration, possibly rhabdo? Could she have a compression fracture in a young, healthy lady less likely? But with IV drug abuse, do I need to be concerned for an epidural abscess? So all these thoughts are going through her head. But then the first issue is pain. Do we treat her pain? She has a history of IV drug use. Yes, we do. And the way we approach it is I ask her, you know, I know you have this. We want to give you something for your pain. Do you want it? And she said yes. So I suggest offering it to the patient. With the anaphylaxis, the codeine, we switched classes to phenylpiperidine, fentanyl. So our workup came back all unremarkable, except for her creatinine kinase. It was five times the normal limit. Sorry, eight. So I go in the room to discuss with her, you know, this could possibly rab be rhabdomyolysis, and it could continue to trend up. We need to keep an eye on you. And what does she tell me? Doc, this has never happened before. I just had brownish-red urine. So obviously, given her history, the concern was for myoglobin, which would also be dipstick positive if it was hemoglobin. Um, but an important thing to note with myoglobin is it has a very short half-life, only two to three hours. So to discuss rhabdomyolysis, what the ultimate mechanism is you end up with decreased ATP levels. This could be due to overexertion, membrane rupture from trauma, and ultimately what you get is these creatinine kinase molecules out of into the circulation. And there's diffuse causes of rhabdo. Um, we all think traumatic and compression. I think those, you know, we always think of that quickly. But the non-traumatic causes, um, both exertional and non-exertional, I want us to be aware of too. And often it's actually multifactorial, and there's more than one of these going on to cause it. Trauma compression. Someone comes in with a crush injury, I think it's pretty high in our differential and we're aware. Also the same with the compartment syndrome, we think of it. But where I think we need to be more cognizant is the, you know, the old person who fell and was on their side for 36 hours and unable to move. We need to consider that too. As for non-traumatic exertion, all people trying to do activities beyond their physical threshold, um, being in warm climates, hyperthermia. And if someone's having repeat episodes, it's important to consider congenital myopathies. As for non-traumatic, non-exertional causes, drugs, commonly alcohol, it can be an SSRI, antipsychotics, we all think statins, infection, both bacterial and viral, and also electrolyte abnormalities, namely hypokalemia and hypophosphatemia are all causes.
So the classic clinical triad that you read about but never see. You know, I was very fortunate we got to see all of these. And the reason we don't see the dark urine is the myoglobin. It has a half-life of two to three hours, and it's not protein-bound. So by the time they present, myoglobin can be completely cleared. So diagnosis. Generally, a CK greater than five times the normal level. Um, but as for acute kidney injury, generally doesn't happen until you have levels greater than 5,000. And you also see electrolyte abnormalities. And an important thing is elevated LFTs may be the initial presentation. So to keep this in your mind. Feared complications include acute kidney injury um, from precipitation of the non-heme, I'm sorry, non-protein heme pigment. Uh, compartment syndrome actually occurs after massive fluid resuscitation because then you have edematous limbs and they can get a compartment syndrome. So for management, do, do isotonic fluids, one to two liters an hour. Consider sodium bicarbonate um, to cause a forced alkaline diuresis. But things not to do, don't do loop diuretics, mannitol, or calcium supplementation. And so in summary here, rhabdomyolysis is a result of muscle breakdown due to multiple causes, and it's generally multifactorial. Keep in mind a CK five times greater than the normal value and history to make your diagnosis. Myoglobin is fleeting and won't always be seen. And use IV fluids to prevent the, to perfuse the kidneys and protect them from tubular obstruction.